trophies. I didn't win. <laughs> Thanks, John, for this honor. I'm the leader of the Tallow of Terrors. We have a new picture. Oh, it's modern. <laughs> I'm the leader of the tallow terrors, and I'd like to recognize the team that has cut down over 50,000 tallow trees in the past 10 years. Um, in the front row, left to right, a picture of Bart Davis, John Taylor, and Scott Warden. Back row, left to right, are yours truly, Brian Burtnick, Al Rosenbaum, and David Frothingham. Missing from the photo are Steve Rice, Pete Altman, Kerry Shapoff, and our leader emeritus, Don McCulloch. They've made a difference in the land is. I see one. Where did you guys settle? Well, I guess they're around. There they are. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I'd like to show you how to identify tallow trees on your property. The leaf provides positive identification, whether on a two-foot seedling or a 50-foot mature tree. Note the heart shape and smooth edges. If you find a small seedling, simply pull it up. If you cannot pull it up, call one of the tallow terrors or public works, and we will cut it and apply a special herbicide to the stump. The problem with tallow trees is if you don't treat the stump with the, the special herbicide we have through Sean Burgess, is that uh, the tree will grow back. It's amazing. I mean, they're very insidious. We hate them. Kill them. <laughs> <laughs> um, your help in finding and eliminating the tallow trees is appreciated. Thank you.
that. So as we go through the financial report, we'll try and keep it a little bit lively. I know it can be a little dry, but we do have some information that I think is relevant that you hear, understand, and get to ask questions on. So Carl, if you would, go ahead and move forward. And we want to start by giving you an overview for how the association works from their financial uh, operational standpoint here. And as you know, if you own a lot out here, you pay an assessment. In 2019 and 2020, that assessment is $1,850. There are 4,420 lots. Multiply that out, comes to a little over $8.1 million in revenue on an annual basis. Now that revenue, once it comes into the association, is apportioned into two different funds, if you will. The first is operations, the other is the capital reserve. Both of these do exactly what their title suggests. The operations is going to provide the money to go ahead and do our day-to-day -day activities, provide the services that we all utilize and enjoy. Now, the capital reserve fund is a restricted fund that is designed to warehouse money strictly for the repair or the replacement of capital assets. Now these capital assets may include things like <coughs> roads, car paths, lagoons, heavy equipment, things of that nature. So there's typically a question that comes up at some point about the capital reserve fund. And one of the questions we wanted to touch on here is why do we have two accounts? Why not just have one that's aggregated together? And it's very simple. It's one of some of the same rationale and reasoning that You've got your personal accounts and you've got your retirement savings accounts. It's because the government gives us tax incentives to do it. That's why we have two accounts in a nutshell. Now, there are other operational components that make this worthwhile, namely the restriction in that it has to be used to maintain the assets that are our long-term foundation for the community. So as we move forward here, we'll touch on uh, the assessments, each one of these different funds, as well as the landings company and uh, the financial report. But I want you to know what we're doing tonight is giving you an overview and the supporting documentation for all of these things are available on the website. So what questions you don't have, please go to the website, look it up. If you've got additional questions, call us. So in looking at 2019 from an assessment standpoint, what we're doing is we're breaking this up on an individual assessment basis. So the assessment for 2019 was $1,850. Originally, the budget uh, had us designating 1,386 of that 1850 operations, 464 over to capital reserves. Now, as the year went on, there were some unexpected occurrences that happened. And it was decided that $972,400 needed to be better allocated from operations over to capital reserves. Now this transfer was enabled primarily due to two reasons. One, has there been good cash flow management by the association of the past couple of years? And the second reason is that we were able to take some of the additional money that we had in operations and lower the amount that we kept in operations down to the minimum allowable in the budget, which is 1.5 million. That's our floor, and that's where we came up with the 972,400 to be able to shift over. Now, after that was completed, the actual allocation from 1850 indicated being $1,166 to operations and 684 to capital reserve. And as we all know, we've all received our assessment for 2020. It's the same for 2020 at 1850. Moving over into operations. As you can see, comparing between 2018 and 2019 in that first number there, <coughs> There was a reduction in 2019 from our total revenue number. As we just discussed, this reduction was primarily due to the transfer of the 972,000. Something else to note on the revenue side is that the marina 
revenue increase was relatively substantial. <coughs> this has been determined that this should be expected moving forward, and we're including that in our budget forecast uh, into the future here. Now, other income includes things like our cell tower leases, the interest earned, dump tickets, recycling revenues, architectural fees, and several other items uh, as we move forward. In regards to the expenses, expenses were up from 2019 compared to 2018 by about $215,000. This is really due to two primary categories. That is staffing and IT. In particular on IT, there were two software packages that were acquired in 2019 and those have been implemented and have provided increased efficiency for the association operations. Our capital reserve fund. By the way, we typically, I don't know about anybody else, I'll say capital reserve or reserve fund, it's the same thing just for clarity. I know you figured that out, I just wanted to designate that for confirmation. As you can see, there was a significant increase in our reserve expenditures between 2018 and 2019. Now, the first item to note here is that capital expenditures do not occur on a levelized basis, okay? It's not gonna be the same year to year because our capital assets don't need to be replaced or repaired that way. Typically, there's a big year and a smaller year big year, smaller year, or a couple strained together. What is important here is that this was more than we anticipated for 2019 and had budgeted for. As part of the reason we uh, had to make that transfer, and it's also just part of the facts of life. So, and going through here, the primary four categories that the reserve expenditure was put towards are our big four capital items. Those are roads, lagoons, car pass, and storm drains. That comprised the majority <coughs> of the 1.8 million. However, there are several other things that also were included in here, such as the replacement of four fleet vehicles, 17 storm cameras, two automatic gate systems, and a fuel dispenser at the Landings Harm Arena that had all reached the end of their useful life. The Landings Company is our wholly owned subsidiary, and this is nothing but good news. As you can see, there's been a significant increase in revenue from 2018 to 2019. This is really due to two things, to have to Raul, who's been so somewhere in here earlier. The, their number of homes sold increased, and the average value of the homes sold increased. Really can't do much better than increasing both of those areas. That's what's driving our increase in the uh, brokerage commission <coughs> revenue. Other revenue is primarily rental income. The thing to note here is that any profits associated with the landings company is plowed back into the landings company in the form of marketing. So for 2019, that meant we had a marketing budget for our community of 1.4 million. Now, in aggregating together the association and the landings company, that's what we're doing here from a consolidated statement standpoint. And from a revenue perspective in 2019, we ended with 18.8 million of revenue, and we had expenses of 19.8 million. It's not very difficult math. We had a loss of about a million six thousand dollars. That, of course, is primarily due to our capital reserve expense. In regards to the balance sheet, the key item here to denote is the cash and investments. We ended 2019 with consolidated cash and investments of 10.3 million, of which 7.3 million is our capital reserve. That's important because it's gonna factor into the balance sheet adjustment that we had to make this year. 
So 2019 is the first year that the Financial Accounting Standards Board has enacted a new accounting standard that we're subject to. And Financial Accounting Standards Board, you may know that uh, under the acronym FASB. So I'm going to read this to you so that I say it correctly. The amount of equity for reserve assessments is now recorded as deferred revenue until expenses are recognized and recorded. The deferred revenue account is included in the other liabilities section of this presentation. The total amount of equity reported as deferred revenue for 2019 is $7.3 million. I'm sure everyone understood exactly what that meant. <laughs> so let me translate that for you. 7.3 million is our capital reserve balance, okay? As we covered in capital reserves, remember this is a restricted fund that can only be used for the repair or replacement of capital assets. Now, that money is not coming back to us, right? It's restricted, it has to be used to repair or replace assets. Now previously, that was included under members' equity. Members' equity is something that we may have a chance of getting back, right? This is what we're going to spend in the future to repair our assets. So all FASB is doing is having us take it and move it from member's equity over into a liability, meaning we're going to spend it at some future point. I think this makes perfect sense, but if you notice and say, where'd my 7.3 million go of equity? It moved up, it's still in the same bank account, it still has the same balance, and it's still going to be used for the same purpose. Just important to note. The 2019 annual report has been concluded, and we have achieved a clean opinion from our auditors. That's very good. That basically confirms that we know where all the dollars and cents are, and they've been applied correctly. The financial report is included online, and it contains an excellent review of the financial and operating results for the association. It may seem a little bit daunting, but it comes with a summary page, a couple, summary couple of pages at the first part of the report. It's very readable, and if you're interested, it provides a very good summary of our overall financial standing. And finally, we thought this would be a good time to touch on the reserve study, just to kind of put this in context in front of everybody. Now this is something that has been going on now for multiple months. You've probably all heard about it, you're probably very aware of it, but we just wanted to use this as an opportunity to reiterate what's happened and what's coming. So the reserve study was initiated primarily for three reasons. First, it was to confirm if our capital reserve funding levels were adequate. Second is to compare what we're doing to industry standards. And third is to address concerns about our infrastructure. So there was an RFP that was issued, which is a request for proposal, for a full reserve study using the Community Association Institute's National Reserve Study Standards. So the study was approved by the board to be implemented in September, Immediately thereafter, an independent reserve specialist was hired and began his analysis. So he came on site numerous times, crawled through all the nooks and crannies, met with all staff, and in January 24, completed his reserve study. Now this is posted on the website. You can go look at it. I think it's only about 580 pages. <laughs> the vast majority of that, though, is actually cataloging each underlying asset of the association. So the first couple of pages, again, contain a very nice summary. It is a little numbers heavy, but it's there for your pleasure if you want to take a look. Now, everybody is still analyzing this and putting together how this is going to be factored into the budget and the forecast moving forward. But one thing we thought important to kind of touch on here is that the National Reserve Standards for an association like ours, they say that there's an adequate level of funding for our reserves if we have between 30 
to 70% of our future liabilities set aside in cash. That's a pretty big spread, isn't it? Now, thankfully, they came back and gave us a little better target from a recommendation standpoint and said, in regards to our management and our assets and the cash flow history that we have had, they're going to recommend that we stay closer on the, the lower end of this perspective than the higher end. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that we'll be fixed at 30% because it'll be tied to our actual assets based on when they are projected to need replacement or repair. But it at least gives us some perspective in regard to what the report indicates and how we should be moving forward. But with that, we'll conclude our financial report. Back to you, John. Starting in August of last year, we began the live streaming of our board meetings, and you can find those on YouTube, I believe. This past year, in, in January, we had three uh, board budget workshops. In October of last year, we had the budget process and budget overview. In November of last year, we had changes to the budget since 2018. And this past January, we had a reserve study analysis all of which I think were very well received and very helpful. We have started Backyard Buzz. On advice of counsel, we don't participate in social media. We don't go back and forth with posters. But that doesn't mean we won't correct when we find out about inaccuracies and incorrect facts. We will, and we use Backyard Buzz. For those of you who remember Dragnet, as Joe Friday would say, just the facts. <laughs> For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> Google it when you get home. <laughs> and we're also working on a new website, updating your current website, trying to make it a website that's more reflective of the 21st century. And there's an additional event that we've added, I call it an event. We started it last month. It's called the Working Neighbor Drop-In. So the second Thursday of every month from 6.30 to 7.30, you can come by the TLI building and there'll be some board members there just to have a discussion. There's no agenda. Um, just what you, whatever you have in your mind, come and discuss it with us. So I believe the next one will be a week from this Thursday. And finally, communication is a two-way street. If you have a problem, concern, complaint, right, tell us. Don't put it on social media and expect us to know what's going on. Because that is not the same. Tell us. We can't address what we don't know. And believe me, we want to communicate and we want to be able to address it. So please, let us know. Now, on to assessment. Yes, assessment. I've been spending a lot of time on that word recently. And in my pre-landings life, I was a history major and an attorney and did a lot of research, and I still do. And you can ask Andy Stegmar about our research, but I decided that I'd like to find out what is the origin of assessment. I know in our covenant it means member dues. And I remember from a law school tax class that there was a thing in England called the Assize Time, where the king would send his men out into the villages to get the sheep and the goats and the chickens and the grain, and bring them back, and then the villagers would start again. So for 550 years, assessment meant tax. And then in 1935, Oxford International Dictionary added a couple of different definitions. Evaluate or review. And I think it's been used in that context. We evaluate our options, we evaluate our opportunities, we evaluate students, we evaluate ourselves. So what I wanted to do is try and put assessment in a context for us here at the Landings. And I would propose the following. 
assessment process our determination of what we need to do to continue enjoying the lifestyle we have and to make the landings better. Staying the same is not an option. The property values don't increase in the community that stays the same. People don't buy houses in a community that stays the same. And as we've seen uh, through Tony's uh, brief explanation of the reserve fund, if we don't take care of our assets, and replace them as necessary and have the funds to replace them, we'll be living in a community that's uh, is going to gradually deteriorate. And we all moved here for different reasons, but I'm pretty confident that we didn't move here to be in a community that stayed the same or deteriorated. So, when Brandon left, they didn't say, okay, here you go, enjoy, things ought to be good for maybe 50, 60 years. <laughs> The landings just doesn't happen. And by that, I mean our community and our lifestyle. It's our responsibility. We live here, we drive on the roads, we use the different facilities that we have. No one else is gonna come in and take care of it. It's up to us, it's our responsibility. We're responsible to make sure the landings continues to be the community we want it to be. It's in the context of this responsibility that the board met in February at our annual strategic planning retreat. And we looked at all the different issues that confront us today. We assessed them, if you will. And we determined unanimously that the most important issue we faced was, to need, was the need to increase member dues. Um, as the slide indicates, we've gone two years with no increase. Um, we have a report on our reserve that we need, need to integrate. And as Tony said, we've got some operations back to the minimum. And there's some operations that we have to take a hard look at to determine whether we need to bring them back into the budget to make this community be as good as it can be. So what does that mean? We will be finalizing and we're looking at, and we'll be working this month to come up with a final assessment. We hope to have it be completed by the end of the month. We hope that and we expect that the board will be acting on it in our meeting. So, um, and okay. So we look for a vote go August to mid to mid September, and during this period of time, there will be a great deal of information that will be presented to the community in many different formats. Um, communication is of paramount importance to us and you will be informed. The board wouldn't be looking for an increase in dues unless it was absolutely necessary. Believe me, life as a board member is a lot easier when you're not trying to get a dues increase. <laughs> it's our responsibility to do so, to see it. We are a community at the crossroads, and we will decide what our future and the type of community we want to be and we will be. So, obviously there's more to come. Are there any questions? As to anything that went on in this meeting. And we have a microphone in the back, so if you would go to the back, uh, speak in the microphone and uh, hopefully someone here with Nile will be able to answer your question. Not necessarily. Okay. I don't have a question. I have more of an uh, observation and a recommendation. I live on a cul-de-sac with five houses. Every week, we bring in four garbage trucks to pick up that garbage. And it seems to me that we're adding more suppliers to that process because I see more white trucks with Joe's garbage on it and leaking hydraulic fluid all over the island. So my suggestion or recommendation would be, I'd, like, I'd ask the board if they would consider uh, evaluating if we can consolidate our supplier base here, 
which in turn would save the wear and tear on the roads and all the ancillary pollution aspects of what these garbage trucks do. Thank you. I'm glad to hear the clapping for that recommendation. Gary, thank you very much for bringing that up. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sherry Haldeman, the general manager here. <laughs> Don't embarrass me, please. Um, and so, garbage is a great example of an area that we have been working on for quite some time, waste collection. We agree. A staff agrees, and I think the board probably would too, it would be ideal to get the number of vehicles, the weight, the volume, the frequency off of our streets. We have explored this. We have talked to some of the bigger providers and said, hey, you know, if you did our whole community, what would the cost be? The big issue there, of course, is they want um, a high percentage. They want to have a minimum at least of 70%. We've also talked to legal counsel, we've also done some research on what restrictions we could put in place relative to the quality, the condition rather, of vehicles and weight limits. That is still underway. We'll continue that work. I'm glad to hear the clapping because one of the questions that we had was, how much would the community support one vendor? And of course, you know, if it makes financial sense, I think that the majority of people would. But our goal is protecting and preserving our infrastructure assets. Thank you for bringing that up. Stay tuned on that. Good. Hey, can you your name? Uh, my name's Rick Armstrong, and I kind of got beaten for the punch there. Uh, you know, we are all basically a group of brothers and sisters here. We're all in the same pot. We all pay the same dues. And going along the same lines as garbage, uh, other communities negotiate things at a higher level to keep the people who live in that community's costs down. And you know, I'd just like to request that the TLA not only look at uh, garbage, but they also look at fire charges uh, for the fire department. Uh, they look at cable TV and Wi-Fi and that they look at uh, cell phones for us all. We've got cell phone towers that we're taking a, uh, an income from. Uh, maybe we can do something with that and offer some cost savings to us uh, to help pay uh, for the increase that John hasn't told us how much it is yet. <laughs> but if you could save us some money, it would be lovely and, and I would like to ask for you know, some sort of response in your communication process going forward as to if we're doing anything at that, because like you said, Sherry, about the garbage, uh, I, I knew nothing about it. And you know, if my garbage right now, you know, pick a number, is uh, $50 a month, and you can do wall-to-wall -wall garbage for me for $30 a month, and well, I'll throw it into my uh, TLA dues, and I'll pay it, and I'll be up $20 a month. Just a thought. Thank you. <laughs> Rick, we'll get back to you. To everyone, including Rick. <laughs> Any other questions? Everyone. Happy. Name's Brad Trigger. <laughs> Yeah, right. please go ahead, state your name and go ahead with your question. So my name is Brad Krieger. Um, I was glad to see that you had listed that we're at a crossroads. And one of the questions I guess I had is are we willing to look at as we're considering changes and increases in our, our assessments um, prior to this time, I haven't lived here an extremely long period of time, but my understanding is that assessment increases kind of happened regularly until just recently when it was voted down. And I think part of the reason there was a vote down on that was a perception of value. And I think that we can all agree that there's been a change in the demographics of um, those who have come into this 
community over time, back in the early uh, 80s, etc., and what was being uh, created and having a strong club membership uh, responsibility uh, saw some amenities that were tied to that process in a, uh, and, and so I think that as the demographics have changed over time, we need to consider that movement. And as that demographic changes, we have to consider those who are less fortunate but are purchased into the landings and find increases difficult to absorb without added value. And so my suggestion or my question is, could we consider increasing um, the assessment tied to a change in how the amenities are, are brought forward. I know that includes and requires an involvement with the club and uh, some of the issues tied to that. But for example, many communities who are very similarly affluent have pools that are a part of the HOA process and are not requiring a club membership that also ties in a required social membership that also requires a tied in dining experience, et cetera, et cetera. My suggestion is that you might want to consider blending something here a la carte in a very small basis that adds value to the assessment and I think you will see a more interested and increased willingness to go past when we start talking about going past two thousand dollars a year etc add some value thank you that would be a question whose answer would take a considerable period of time and one that i would be happy to discuss with you later and just to be very clear, though, I do want to say, I think it's important to acknowledge that the, the association has taken the position, will continue to take the position, that we do not compete with the club. And I, I need to say that because the example that you um, offered up, the pool, would be in direct competition with the club. We try to partner and collaborate as much as we possibly can, but I believe it's really important to acknowledge that up front. Um, we think that the health and, and uh, vitality of the club is critical, and vice versa. I think the club would acknowledge that the association is too. I'm, I'm not saying that it's a, a point of disagreement on anything I, I that you agree said. That the, I, I agree that the club has their own bylaws and their own responsibilities, and the association is not tied to that. Mm -hmm. I'm offering the consideration that the possibility of the two working together for the betterment of both is a, a, an idea that might prove to be useful. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Robert Stevenson. I've lived out here for 25 years. I'm not a golfer. I have no interest in golf. I do not belong to the club because I was one of those he spoke about. I'm a retired university professor. And I could not afford or chose not to afford uh, those amenities. And I don't think I should be punished for those who are more affluent who use the golf paths, uh, who have their boats. Maybe that's a point where you might consider additional revenue. But the other thing I wanted to ask is this. Since the funds, the reserve funds, are restricted, I'm sure they're not just over there in a pot. So I'm assuming that they are being invested, even in short-term investment, and I would like to hear something about where that interest goes and can it be used to assist in lowering what we pay. Good question. So one of the things that has happened over the past year is there's been an investment committee designated and solely with the focus of looking at overseeing and adjusting the investment policy statement on the reserve funds in particular. And I'll say what has happened is over the past year in particular, there has been some significant improvement 
in regards to how those funds are allocated in return that is generated. And we have to be careful here and it, because we really take the, the position that it needs to be done on a risk-free basis. It's tough in a market like today, well, maybe it's not tough over the past week <laughs> to realize the fluctuations, but if you look at 2019 where you're getting 20, 25, 30%, it's tough to say I've got $7 million that's not participating in that. But at the same time, if it's going up 20%, it may go down 20%, and we can't sit here in front of you and say, guys, look, we just lost 1.4 million of your money, our money. That's not a position we can be in. So we take, we, we have it invested and allocated, but it's in risk-free investments uh, that are gonna provide a guarantee for greater return. Very interesting. Tony, I just add to that, that that interest is in the reserve fund. And that's an important note. Thank you. My name is Gary Hughes, and just to uh, expand on the Jill Friday philosophy uh, with just the facts. 72% of the, the residents in this community belong to the club. And you're going to require an assessment to build a pool for public use or any other amenity that competes with the club you're going to lose 72 percent of the votes we're not going to double dip it and it, you know if you want to join and you want to have the amenities that the club offers we welcome you but you're not going to be able to pass an assessment that says we're going to build a public pool period thank you My name is Lindy Dillard. Apologize for my dress. We just came off the bocce court, so and we lost. But, <laughs> but I have a couple of issues that I really would like to bring to your attention. You know, I've always been your best champion. But a couple of issues. We first we thank you for cleaning up under the Delegal building the water that's been there for a couple of years, and then we're getting that back to where it should be. But a couple of things that are going on is you know that the marina is a money maker for us. And it's quite, you know, the first impression that some people get of the island when they bring their boats and dock there. I would ask that you take a look, that the association take a look at what Steve Fruin and his team have done over at the deck with the drop curtains, the plastic, I call them plastic, they're not plastic, but the drop curtains and look at the captain's room there. We've had a couple of events, our boating clubs, have had a couple of events there where we feel like we're there in the middle of winter because the wind is is very strong and look at placing those same drop clear see-throughs so that we don't have teenagers going in and having parties there as his or his or uh, see-through and take a look at the furniture that's in there so that people that come off of their boats can sit and enjoy maybe an evening just having a drink inside that little room I think the cost would be minimal, but again, it's our first impression, and you only get one, one chance to make a first impression. So, um, also, I think we ought to look at um, what we're charging for the sunset room there. Belong to a couple of groups, and paying $450 for an evening there in the middle of the week. We take our events off land, you know, off the island, because, you know, we've had a couple of events there that, but, you know, we shouldn't have to go off island when we own that property. Mm -hmm. So if we could look at the cost of what we're leasing that or renting that evening for, you know, it even goes up higher on the weekend. You know, maybe you lease it to the members of the, the residents here for less and anybody that isn't a resident, you charge more. But I'm sorry, I just think that's an outrageous price. So, and, uh, I know we don't compete with the, the club, but I think, you know, we've got two marinas. There, sh there should be some kind of money maker there of either a restaurant or a snack bar or something that's out there, even if you lease it back. We don't compete with them, lease it back to the club. But, you know, boaters that should come in may want to have a drink, may want to have whatever, you know, but, but it's sitting there and it, it's a money maker that we're looking over and missing. So, just a couple ideas to throw out. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
My name is Greg Birch. I'm from Savannah, born here. I just wanted to ask a quick question of the young man. Um, Talking, and you said something. The number of somewhere around nine hundred seventy-two thousand dollars that was um, moved from one to the other, and it was either you said it was uh, an emergency, or I don't really remember why you said it was moved. That seems like a, I don't think I've ever, I've never moved nine hundred seventy-two thousand dollars out of my checking account to my savings account. But anyway, did you? I don't think you ever said what the reason was. You just said there was, there was a like something in nine hundred seventy-two thousand dollars. That seems like a lot of money to. Now I'm new to the board, so I am going to actually pass this back to Sherry so she gives you the exact number as opposed to the overall uh, picture, which I can speak to. But the underlying, I'm going to pass it. To okay. So the the. You're, the number is actually correct, and, and do you have the slide back up there, please? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Oh. That's good. Okay, so we transferred $972,000. Um, and we transfer, that term is something that we do every year. All the money comes in, and then at the end of the year, it gets transferred to the reserve. So doing it at the end of the year is a part of our normal process, okay? Um, it was made from operating to the capital reserve, and it was a one-time occurrence, and I think that was the point that you were trying to make from, from operating fund to the reserve fund. Um, it's a function of managing the cash down to that 1.5 million floor. That's the minimum that we need to operate and that's set by board policy. And then the, what, I, what we would call any additional cash, whether it's from cost reductions, which was a significant part of what was done last year and the year before, um, additional revenue that comes in. As Tony pointed out, we had a 5% increase in Marina. Actually, we had 10% increase in this year's budget in revenue that is not assessment revenue sources. So it's a combination of factors um, that generates either more revenue or work that's done to reduce expenditures that determines the total amount of the transfer. We estimate the amount of the transfer at the beginning during the budget process. But as you go through the year and you obviously staff's been charged with finding ways to reduce expenses. And every time they're successful in doing that, it's going to increase the amount of the transfer. The idea here is that that transfer be as sizable as possible because it's going into the restricted capital reserve fund. Carl, do you want to add any comments? Okay. Well, I just, I it just, I don't know if anybody else may have heard it this way, but it just seemed like that it sounded like when well, we had an unexpected expense where we had to transfer 900 that's, and I, if I'm, I'm sorry if I misheard it, but I, that's what I thought, so anyway. Oh, the unexpected amount was the was the road work. I think that's what you were referencing. The storm drains the road work. And we had about three items, three big items last year, and they amounted to three fifty, three hundred fifty thousand um, dollars The one was, the circle right outside um, the main entrance there where the road deteriorated and we had to go in and take care of that. Uh, Sean, where are you? Oh, there you are. You look nice in your suit and tie. <laughs> yeah. We had three total expenses. Uh, two were paving related. One was the failure of the sub base of the road behind the main gate. The second one was the entrance lane uh, as you come into Deer Creek through the village uh, all the way up um, just before you get to Short Shelwyn. And the third was a storm drain pipe that actually separated and created a uh, sinkhole um, near Wiley Bottom off and, of the north. Way north right. Yes, those are the three expenditures. Um, I'm Lynn Jackson and I've been around since dirt. Uh, 
<laughs> and I just have a question, and I, I did call the club, and the club said call the association, and the association said they didn't know, but they thought something. So this is my question. I think I understand, I'm a club member, so I think I understand they have 100 new um, memberships out there. I think they've sold 65 and then 35 to sell. This is off-island memberships. And I said, well, how do they get through the gate? And they said, well, we don't have anything to do with that. And then somebody said that they get, they'd have to pay $50 a year. Well, that's nothing. Yes, they may be members of the club, but that didn't pay for the roads and the marina and everything else. Is there any way to get a little more money? <laughs> Um, so that's a real question, and, and you're right, uh, except that those people that are coming in are going only to the club. They do not have the right of and the privilege that all residents have to use all amenities. Um, so annually, oh, well, they can only use the club, they're paying the club well, no, dues. they can go to the marinas and they're out on the road. And you, you're right, there is access from uh, the gate, obviously going to the clubhouse. We have to pay the vehicle at the gate. You're right, that's, that's correct. So annually we look at all fees and, and when we were looking at the fees for frequent visitors, other people, other categories of people who don't live at the landings, we felt that at that particular point in time, and certainly it can be revisited again, but at that particular point in time, um, the recommendation was made to make all non-resident access fees the same because we were trying to introduce a level of equity there. Now, they shouldn't be going to the marina and they shouldn't be using any other association amenities. So if you ever see that, you call me, okay? We'll send somebody out. But you're right, and we'll look at that again, as we always do during our fee reviews. Thank you. So I'm Rosemary Mackey, and Irv and I moved here four and a half years ago, and every time I look at the hundred, uh, the $1,080.50, I think, oh, thank God, because that was one month of what I paid in New York for our maintenance <laughs> about the things that are so important in terms of the reserves. The roads, the lagoons, the storm drains, and there was one more thing which I've forgotten. Uh, my question is, what is the risk-benefit ratio of us not agreeing to increasing our assessment so that we have enough money in those reserves to take care of our beautiful island. We all come over that bridge and we go, everything is wonderful, we love it, but it costs a hell of a lot more when things go wrong if we haven't budgeted for them. We know that in our own houses, so I'd love you to address that. Call it the risk benefit. Where, where are you? The risk benefit. Anyone. Okay. I can't give you the exact risk benefit ratio of that, but what I will say is something's got to give. Yeah. And you know, truly, um, we and we talked about this internally at length. What services can we eliminate? What services can we reduce? What costs can we cut out of operations? Because frankly, that reserve is. The, to me, it's really important. It, it's really important because if you defer maintenance, as you pointed out, everybody knows it only costs more. So you can defer it, and a lot of places do that, but there are serious consequences to that. Not only the safety of our community, but very much so the increased cost 
down the road to take care of that. You know, um, we can eliminate amenities. But think about this. Many of the amenities that the association provides are generating revenue from the users. So, as an example, our community members did fundraising to create the dog park. So the people that use that dog park to this day pay fees that cover the cost of operating the dog park. All the maintenance, repair, improvements that go into that dog park are not paid by your assessment dues. They are paid by the people who have pets who pay that fee. The same is true with the marina, with the exception of capital. Okay? All of the operating costs of the marinas are paid by the, I'm looking at you, you're a boater, <laughs> by, the, by the boaters. Uh, so I think it's important to understand when people decide they're going to, oh, let's get rid of that, let's get rid of that. You gotta remember you're eliminating revenue from those kinds of amenities. I think that's that's really important. The answer to the question is not easy. It's going to involve, the, if we propose an assessment and it doesn't pass, it's going to involve some significant choices on the part of the board, the staff, and this community. So um, I can't be more specific at this particular point in time. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Dana Kim, John, 28 year resident of uh, the Skidway Island. So I don't know where I'm going to retire to, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, over the years we've had very, very high hopes of improved traffic flow off the island. And it seems like every year it just gets worse and worse. And uh, my wife and I also have a house on uh, St. Simons. And they seem to have solved most of their traffic problems with uh, very great use of traffic circles. I know this is a, a bad topic, but, uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> but uh, I'm desperate for solutions uh, uh, to that problem. You know, the main thing is, is the grouping up the traffic. If you look at the traffic going down the highway, we're using probably 20% of it. So all the cars are all grouped together, bumper to bumper, and then there's huge hiatuses where there's no cars on there because of the intermittent light traffic. But I wanted to bring that up and, uh, and give everybody a lot of anxiety. But, but I will tell you, on St. Simons, it works great. Thank you. Around about this time of the county is high growth. We hear from them repeatedly that this would be the best thing for us. And I suspect personally it's coming, and it's coming sooner than later. I can't tell you what the sooner is, but I have my own idea what the sooner is. We met with them, and the process to actually get the roundabout is, well, it's about a, <coughs> almost a two-year process. So if they said they were going to do it April 1st, it's roughly going to be two years before we're tra traversing the roundabout. We're going to need probably three of them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? If not, thank you for coming. Oh well, all the traffic circles. But you know, you know that's what Chad County was. I'm not at the village.